Hello everyone, uh, welcome to the UFS webinar series. Uh, this webinar is hosted by uh, OSTI and um, this session has been so also been supported by WPO from OAR. Uh, the goal of this webinar series is to enhance communication and share advancement in all aspects of the UFS in both research and operational settings. Um, my name is Bhavana and I work with Yang Shui, who is the program manager at OSTI, to continue uh, to coordinate and develop this webinar. Feel free to contact me if you have any comments and suggestions. Um, today's webinar is going to be presented by Dr. D from the Joint Center of Satellite Data Accumulation. Uh, he is going to be introduced by Tom Aliyane, who is the director of JCSEA. Uh, before we get started, I wanted to quickly go over a couple of housekeeping things. Um, the first thing is um, I just wanted to walk you through uh, where you will find the recording from uh, from the webinar and uh, how to see an archive of all the webinars. So if you go to the UFS portal, which is at ufscommunity.org, and uh, scroll down to the Stay Connected section, um, there is a button here to subscribe to new webinar announcements, and then you can view uh, recordings of previous webinar over here uh, by clicking on the UFS webinar archive. For today's um, for to, at today's presentation, uh, everybody's the attendees microphone and webcam webcams have been disabled. Uh, you can raise your hand if you'd like to be unmuted. Uh, we, we are planning to have the presentation last for about 45 minutes, followed by a 15 minute Q&A session. Uh, keep your, uh, please type your questions in the question box during the presentation. Uh, Tom Aliene, uh, please go ahead. Uh, I'll hand it over to you to introduce Dr. Dick, please. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Tom Olinier. I'm the director of the JCSDA, the Joint Center for Satellite Data Simulation. It's my pleasure and honor to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Dick D today. Uh, Dick has a long experience with uh, applying mathematics and, and data simulation and has had a very uh, productive uh, career in, in that field. He uh, he um, started with a, a PhD in applied mathematics at uh, New York State uh, University in the current Institute of Mathematical Sciences, and has uh, been uh, uh, occupying multiple uh, functions, including a, a professor in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, and in New York uh, uh, University, uh, and uh, has been a research scientist in Delft, in the Netherlands. Um, He's also uh, been for a long time uh, um, a scientist in uh, in NASA, what uh, used to be called uh, DAO, the Data Simulation Office, and it's called now GMAO, and has contributed quite a lot in the, in the field of, of of data simulation, including uh, the adaptive Kalman filter, covariance estimation, modest bias correction, observation quality control. Um, I had the pleasure uh, to uh, work with Dick uh, in uh, the European Center for uh, Medium Wave Weather Forecasts, uh, where he was working on the variational bias correction for the observations that's uh, been implementing operations there. Um, and he actually also worked for a long time at ECMWF on the reanalysis project, era interim and then era CLIM. Uh, looking at a uh, uh, couple data simulation, long time series of uh, of, uh, of uh, observations and homogeneous uh, time series for climate studies that's that's being used around the world, and this is really spearheaded uh, a, a whole field of, of of science there. In 2014, uh, Dig D became the deputy head of the the Copernicus Service for uh, Climate Change at ECMWF. And uh, he, uh, he moved to uh, the US in 2019. So about a year ago, uh, Dick has joined us at the uh, Joint Center for Satellite Data Simulation. And he's the uh, 
senior lead for observations, where uh, his job is, is leading a team with uh, multifaceted uh, ambitious uh, goals, uh, some of which are to uh, uh, develop a state-of-the-art suite of uh, observation uh, capabilities in, the, in that app store that we call the Unified Forward Operator. And uh, another one is, uh, is to uh, have a very uh, adaptive uh, capability to uh, estimate the observation impact. All right, so I hope I, I gave a fairly good uh, uh, overview of, of, of the extensive uh, experience in, in data simulation. And, and without further ado, I'm happy to, uh, to leave the, the floor now to take for a, hopefully a great presentation. Thank you very much. Okay, can you hear me, everybody, or just one of you? Just yes. to uh, verify. Okay, great. Thanks, Tom. That was much too long. Next time, please take less time so you can be much shorter. <laughs> you just make me feel really old with all these things I've done in the past. But anyway, um, I was asked to talk about climate reanalysis and a little bit about best practices. And I think that means that I should talk about my recent experience at ECMWF because that's where um, I used to be in charge of reanalysis and we went through quite a, a long evolution in reanalysis and we learned a lot of lessons or are still learning a lot of lessons so I think that hopefully will be useful to talk about so 99 percent of this presentation is about ECMWF I, I will say something about the Joint Center in the end as well hopefully um but that's uh that's the story and there's so many people to thank uh, that i worked with and who are responsible for many of the much of the work here uh there's a whole big new reanalysis team at ECMWF led by hans, hans hersbach um, and then there's some very important people in my career at ECMWF or retired from ECMWF that i want to acknowledge saki upala who was in charge of the era 40 project and Adrian Simmons, who was there from the very beginning and is still uh, very productive, and Jean-Noël Tepo, who was my boss at the uh, Copernicus Service. So these are very important people that I worked very closely with, and uh, I'm really grateful to them. So if we can go to the next slide, um, that just gives a very brief sketch of the story. Um, it shows uh, on left. Bavana. Can you click the presentation mode on, on the button, right? Yes. Yeah, thank you. That's good. Oh, this, this doesn't work. Let me see. Well, you have okay. to swap screens, I think. Um, well, hmm. OK. So I'm. Not seeing the right thing now. Yeah. Is the display correct? No. No. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. I can't swap screens. I don't know why. Um, so I, let's just stick to this very dangerous though. Yeah, except mm -hmm. that you will not see some of the slides correctly in this way because there are some animations. So if you click on the if you go back to what you did before, you should be able to swap displays um, on the top display settings. Yes, swap. Okay. That should do it. Okay. okay. Great. So here's the story. Um, it starts at the bottom left with ECMWF. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the history of reanalysis at ECMWF. It was very much a research activity to support the development of the integrated forecast system so their nwp system um, but that evolved into a research activity that got bigger because it got support in the european commission or the european union to develop a new set of services in europe about um, environment and change and that left led to several large collaborative research projects that allowed us to do some interesting development in data rescue and coupled data simulation, et cetera. And ultimately that became the Copernicus program, which is an earth observation program with several um, operational services 
um, that rely very heavily on reanalysis. So that's basically the story, and um, it's a it's a very happy ending story, or at least the current state, because where we are now um, is very different from where it started. We now have reanalysis firmly embedded in the operational services that ESMWF and other institutions in Europe provide. So that means that there really is sustained funding for uh, development of reanalysis, observation, improvements, many other things, data services, and so on. So that's a really good situation to be in. Uh, next, please. Next slide, yeah, and that that gives uh, the next couple of clicks will give a quick um, history of reanalysis productions over the years at ESMWF. There are the atmospheric ones, which most of you know. We like to think that Figgy was the first real um, modern reanalysis, even though it was only a year uh, long data set, but it was really the first digital um global data set that um, described the complete um, circulation of the atmosphere so in that sense and based of observations of course so in that sense it really was the first reanalysis and it was a very international collaboration and that set the tone for all the other reanalyses that followed um, so it also explains why the latest um, reanalysis at ECMWF is called era 5 uh, we just decided to start um, counting forward instead of trying to make up um, um, new names each time. Um, so this is atmosphere and land and after era 40 also included ocean waves and beginning with era 5 was funded or completely supported by uh, the Copernicus program. If you click again please. There, there are also ocean reanalyses of course. Um, produced at ESMWF and um, since recently also they include sea ice. Next please. And then um, in the so-called era CLIM projects that Tom mentioned, we were able to uh, start developing century-long reanalyses and um, the important outcome of this, well there were several things that came out but one of the more interesting ones is that we uh, for the first time applied a couple data simulation and I'll try to show a little bit about that later on. Uh, next, please. So then there, of course, are land products as well, and um, they're connected to the atmospheric reanalyses. And um, currently there is a product that is derived from era five, which is again, supported by Copernicus. And next, please. And then there are the atmosphere composition reanalyses also now supported by Copernicus. So that's really quite a lot of activity. and. Um, I want to show you or tell you why this is so important at, at ESMWF that they have kept this going even before um, this kind of uh, funding that we have today uh, was available. Uh, next, please. So the, here's just a list of reasons why it's, why it's important and really embedded in uh, sort of the culture at ESMWF to, to do reanalysis. It's obviously a very good test bed for data simulation because you really encounter all the different problems um, in a very uh, useful way that um, helps you tell things about, helps you learn things about the forecast model, um, how to make better use of observations. That was really the original reason that people back in the um, early 80s at the beginning of ESMWF um, started talking about reanalysis and that it should be should be done to help uh, improve data simulation basically. Lots of problems come up when you try to um, produce a reanalysis that um, actually fix bugs in the in the basic system. Then of course the data themselves are really useful for research and development. Um, it gives you sort of a comprehensive verification data set for new developments uh, in physics or whatever that you are doing in the model. Um, it's also, um, and this is a really important one, um, it allows a whole new set of forecast products that are essentially probabilistic and require really good um, climatologies to be actually skillful. That's important. And then, as you know, because that's uh, sort of the, the main driver, at least at NOAA, 
it's also really um, essential to have a good reanalysis if you want to do monthly and seasonal forecasting. And then the final thing is that they're also extremely popular with external users. And you know that uh, probably everybody in the audience has probably used reanalysis data um, for research or whatever other purpose. And um, reanalysis data are also more and more used for other uh, downstream systems um, in different um, you know, special areas, in different sectors of society and so on. And so they become uh, more and more important for services development. And you know, this last part is what really um, is now delivering the sort of bread and butter uh, that we need to keep going with reanalysis. So it's quite important for us. Um, can we see the next one, please? So I want to just give a very quick example of how um, reanalysis can be used in evaluating forecast performance. And this is uh, uh, something really embedded at ECMWF in the culture to do this kind of thing. So we know that the forecast skill in NWP changes over time, hopefully in the positive direction, but you know, due to several things. Uh, one is obviously the model and data simulation changes, higher resolution, better physics, etc., and the data simulation itself. Um, the other is the changes in the observing system. And the third one is just the predictability regimes that you know change over time in the atmosphere. So when you look at the curve like uh, the red one here, that's a skill score for um, precipitation in the high resolution um, NWP system. And you see that's improved over time, but you know not monotonically and there are all kinds of variations. If you look at the same skill score from um, reforecasts from era interim, you see some of the same variations, but it's obviously more uh, flat. And that's because it's using uh, a frozen version of the IFS. In this case, it was a 2006 version, um, slightly lower resolution than the NWP system. So you see the curve starts pretty close to the, to the red one but then sort of stays in that same, um, at that same level. Uh, next, please. Now, if you look at the difference, then you essentially isolate the effect of the upgrades because, um, you know, the observing system is roughly the same and the predictability, of course, is also the same. So that curve here is really useful because it does tell you actually what is the impact of uh, model and data simulation upgrades. And so you can do this on a routine basis if you have a reanalysis that is updated in time, in real time. And it, it really helps um, even in the short term, let's say of a few months to uh, assess impact of changes in the model. Uh, so next please. And then of course you can do that for all parameters because reanalysis is very comprehensive. So you can see much more detail in this way. The only requirement is really that the reanalysis system should be at least similar to the NWP system. So, I mean, ideally it should be the same system, but that's not practical because um, it takes a long time to produce a reanalysis. But it does mean that you have to um, redo a reanalysis occasionally. And with ear interim, that was definitely the case. Uh, it was almost 10 years old and it started to uh, get old and too old, so if, for example, it couldn't it, um, it couldn't really handle lots of observations that the uh, NWP system uh, uses, and then the differences become um, too large to be able to do this usefully. Next, please. And then, as I mentioned, um, for probabilistic forecast products, which are becoming more and more popular, and more important for um, well, in Europe, especially for the member states, but everywhere, of course. And this is just an example of uh, a very popular product, which is the extreme uh, forecast index that tells you, um, you know, likely areas where uh, certain types of um, extreme weather are likely to occur. And that's extremely useful for uh, planning, of course. 
So this kind of product um, can only be produced if you have a good climatology and really the, the value of the product depends on how good the climatology is. Um, next please. So then I mentioned services. So now I'd like to actually spend 10 minutes or so talking about um, this whole Copernicus program and what it means. And it's something that has been talked about for a long time. So this is a slide from Adrian Simmons that was um, developed by people at this um, World Climate Conference, including Kevin Trenberth and others. And they were sketching out, you know, how um, env uh, environmental services could be developed um, based on the um, capabilities that exist in weather forecasting, etc. And so the key thing about this plot is that right from the beginning, it was recognized that reanalyses, both global and regional, would be central in, in uh, services like that because of the sort of comprehensive information that they provide, um, making the best possible use of observations and models um, in all time scales. Um, so, so that was sort of the beginning of um, a central role for reanalysis in these emerging uh, plans for services. Uh, next, please. So that led to the Copernicus program, which is an Earth observation program in Europe. Um, a large investment. Um, the hardware is basically the Sentinels, which many of you know about. So that's the satellites that are operational satellites planned out for the next 20, 30 years um, to monitor atmosphere, ocean and land and climate um, in many different ways. So that's, of course, a large investment. Um, but the really unique thing about this program is that the initial investment from the beginning, it was recognized that without services, you really cannot benefit um, from any or from most of these data. So uh, roughly 20% of the budget, which let's see over the last, uh, the beginning of the period, the last seven, eight years um, amounts to probably a little over 100 million euros per year was spent on development of services. And that's a lot of money. Um, can we go next, please? So Copernicus, uh, set off six different services, information services, three of them uh, associated with the different components of the Earth system, land, marine, and atmosphere, and three cross-cutting services, a security service, emergency management service, so that's about, you know, fire warning, flood warnings, and so on, and the Copernicus Climate Change Service. And the way that these work is they're supposed to use, of course, the um, Copernicus data, but any other data and models to um, be able to serve the users, the different use cases in society for environmental information. And the climate change service in particular was um, very new, something that didn't really exist at all and had to be built up from scratch. Some of the other ones, had a legacy in other activities or uh, research projects, for example, the atmosphere monitoring service, which is about essentially constituents and air quality, um, had a history in the MAC projects and the, the, before that GEM. So they had basically a 10 year startup in, in research, but uh, climate change services really was a brand new thing in, in 2014. Next, please. So um, the way that works is that the European Commission selected different institutions to implement these services, and they chose ESMWF for two of them, uh, namely atmosphere composition and climate. Um, next, please. So in particular, the climate change service, which is what I was part of over the past uh, seven or eight years, um, is about providing climate information in a form that is useful for the 
different applications in society. So one of the most, um, let's say, difficult um, aspects of implementing this service was how do you get from uh, petabytes of data in you know difficult data sets with all of the all of which have their own strengths and weaknesses and how do you combine and process these data in a way that is suitable for users or how do you allow users themselves to process these data so um, the sort of infrastructure for the whole service is this so-called climate data store and that provides access to all these data including reanalyses with other space-based observation data sets, um, climate models for um, scenarios and projections, regional and global, and many other types of data. So that, that's a very interesting thing in itself. I'm not going to talk too much about it, but all the reanalysis data that you see now coming from ESMWF are coming through this climate data store. So there's a whole big service chain uh, that makes it uh, easier to access uh, the reanalysis data and combine them with other data sets, um, including the tools that you need to do that. Uh, next, please. Uh, so one of the things that is most uh, visible, let's say, in the climate service is that we, we, I still say we, I'm used to that, sorry. Um, we provided climate bulletins every month, which were produced very close to real time. You actually see them in the press nowadays because they come out so quickly because it's produced using um, NWP methods, including reanalysis, um, to, to actually develop most of these um, data sets and change maps and so on automatically. And then they're uh, supplied with some editorial content to um, make it useful for society. So there's a whole lot of activities um, surrounding that. Next, please. So that's about enough, I think, about the services. I just thought it was important to give you the context because it is what really um, allows reanalysis to be sustainable nowadays in Europe. And, and that's, I think, very important to keep in mind that um, the way that happened is that it was recognized that there are so many use cases that are ex extremely valuable and they, they that needs to be the focus so that that's a, a lesson i think that um, you know if we want to um, find a system for for making reanalysis sustainable we have to think about the users and what they really need and um, the users include scientists but probably um, it's more important sometimes to focus on users who are not um, research scientists, but uh, who are who are working in applications and need um, to develop operational services where they can be where they can rely on um, proper access and support. So now the elephant in the room is well, reanalysis and climate. I mean, I know that's a controversial subject has been discussed over the years uh, some people would say you really can't use reanalysis for climate um, i don't agree with that but you definitely have to be careful so i do want to talk for 10 minutes about this question is it possible to accurately represent climate trends and variability in reanalysis so the fundamental problem i think you all know about is that observation coverage changes over time and models which are used in reanalysis have biases. And these biases are only partly corrected by observations. So that's already a big problem because then it's very easy to see. Um, and I like to use this little cartoon here, uh, why you would get uh, problems with representing trends, for example. So if you have, um, here's a, the, the black line, represents the truth, let's say, the true climate, and you have observations in red, and you have a model that produces short forecasts in a data simulation system, but the forecast is biased, so it's always drawing up. And then what you see is that observations actually pull the, um, the uh, forecast back to the truth, but only to, you know, that 
that, that depends on the coverage. So if you are in a situation like this, you will actually see a false trend uh, because the coverage changes suddenly and you have a smaller bias in the analysis than you had before. So this is very obvious and easy to understand. Um, next, please. The problem is that it's not only that, and it's not only the model biases, but the observations themselves are also biased in many cases, in most cases, I would say. And even the data simulation methods that we have today um, may exacerbate the problem in many ways. So there are lots of examples. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about this problem and some of the issues and pieces of evidence, but also mainly about progress. So next, please. So here's a real case that is exactly the same as that little cartoon that I just showed. These are um, <clears throat> two meter air surface, uh, sorry, two meter air temperature anomalies. Um, the difference between era 40, which is pretty old by now, um, and CRUTEM, which is you know, one of the benchmark data sets from based on station data. And these are type of data sets that NOAA also produces and NASA that are based on <clears throat> just um, climate reports from station data. <clears throat> and they're quite reliable, but of course they also have issues, but uh, they go back very far. And this is what we usually refer to when we look at climate change since the pre-industrial uh, period. So this difference here is um, obviously not flat. And it's known uh, that era 40, the model in era 40 had a warm bias. And if you don't have enough um, SYNOP stations, in other words, <clears throat> to correct that, then you um, get exactly what we saw on the previous slide. So that's what you see here. So era 40 is actually okay after, um, or in the satellite period after 79, it's pretty, agrees pretty well with station data, but um, when you get less coverage, then um, it gets worse. Next, please. <clears throat> By the way, the spike in, in there in 1980 is a problem in the CRUTEM um, data set. So just to indicate, like I said before, observations also have problems. This happens to be a quality control problem where somebody swapped one month um, for another. And so that's how you got that spike. Next, please. <clears throat> that that was corrected so there's a new version of the observation data set and now you see somewhat better agreement with era 40 but of course the bias problem remains this is to illustrate what i said earlier that observations have problems too and they need to be worked on um, and it takes time to find the problems and correct them so that's a just like the reanalysis itself these data sets also have to get constant attention and there's work to do to improve them. Next, please. So if you look now at the atmosphere as a whole, so th this is a nice set of plots from Adrian Simmons, one of his papers. He has several uh, very good papers on um, climate variability and trends in reanalysis data. Uh, very detailed, of course, just sort of his style. Uh, lots of information in there, uh, really worth reading those papers if you have interest in this. So this gives a bit more complete picture for three different reanalyses, ERA interim, ERA 40, and JRA 55, Japanese reanalysis. And if you look, um, glance at the two um, plots, so they, they give the anomalies at different pressure levels in the atmosphere. You can see that the troposphere is pretty consistent among them. You see some clear signals like the 1998 El Nino, which has a very deep effect in throughout the troposphere. You see on the right panel, you see the um, volcanic eruptions and the effect in the um, stratosphere. So all of that is in there, so that's good, but there are definitely differences, especially in era 40, which really had poor bias correction in many observation sources. And then in the stratosphere, you see things go pre haywire near interim. There's this huge jump at one hectopascal, but it's also visible at five. And really, you cannot really trust the trends over, um, you know, 10, 10 hectopascal and up. And we know, we know how these things happened. I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that later, but this just shows that 
there is definitely good information about uh, trends, the lower lower stratosphere cooling is in, in near interim, for example, um, but you have to be very careful to use them. Next, please. Um, hydrological cycle is even more challenging. This is another plot that just shows for different reanalyses compared to observation data sets, so RSS and GPCP, uh, which are at the bottom there. Um, the different, uh, this is for tropics, uh, total column water vapor and ocean precipitation rates. Um, let's look at the bottom one and you see that the area interim is uh, improved over the other reanalyses. It's still a bit high compared to the observation data sets, but there is discussion about whether the observation data sets are actually not too low. But the point is that um, variability is fairly well represented. Now, if we look a little bit more in detail, the next slide, please. Um, <clears throat> again, precipitation rates, but now just for area interim and area five. And if you look at the left um, plot, <clears throat> notice that the scale here is much finer. So the difference, differences are um, you know, amplified so that we can see what's going on, but they are actually not that large. Um, but the blue curve for area interim, you do see this dip in the early 90s, and then an upward shift again around 2000, 2005 and 2010. And we know that came from uh, a simulation of SSMI data in the tropics using uh, the first ever version in ESMWF of the rain affected radiances simulation. And it just wasn't good. And there were some problems in it. And we know what that is. It was a risky thing to put it in a reanalysis. <clears throat> and it caused this um, shift and you can see actually when you look at the, the different SSMI instruments uh, flying that it's actually proportional to the uh, number of observations that were available so this is another example of the observation coverage but also complicated by a uh, wrong use of the data and in era five there's a 10-year period between the models so Rain assimilation, rainy uh, radiance assimilation has really improved. So you don't see that anymore. That uh, dip is still slightly visible, but it's almost gone. Um, but now, if you then look at evaporation, you see we still have some problems there because they should be very close to each other, which they are from uh, the mid 90s on to around 2012. But then Things are going off again, so we don't really know exactly what's going on here, but there are definitely still lots of issues to improve on. Next, please. This is energy flux. It's really the same story. Um, I see that I'm actually um, going very slowly, so I'm going to skip pretty quickly through this, but essentially the real problem here, if you look at the table, um, and compare with the trend birth at all estimates of the different uh, energy flux components, which in, in that paper have been estimated from various, various sources. Um, and it's sort of a benchmark uh, to look at. Um, you see that we still have in era five, a large um, net um, uh, um, budget at the, uh, at the surface, which is uh, really wrong. That should be very close to zero, and it isn't. Um, the problem is that the data simulation itself adds energy to the system. And with a model uh, that is constrained by um, surface boundary conditions that are fixed, there's no way to um, um, take care of that. So the, the energy is absorbed by the surface, and that uh, that's wrong. So this is possibly uh, an argument or a hope, let's say, that with, when we get to uh, coupled models and coupled data simulation, there are perhaps ways to address this. Okay, um, more information in this paper that um, you've seen appeared uh, several times uh, from Hans Hersbach, which is the paper on um, era five, which came out a few months ago. Uh, it's an excellent paper, and this this is from that paper, and there's lots of discussion there if you're interested. The next, please. 
Okay, this is the last one on progress, and I like it because it's a very, um, it's a little bit subtle, but it, it's a good single picture that shows where we're heading, I think. So we are comparing um, tropical 100, 100 hectopascal temperature, 12 months running mean. Uh, so this is uh, lower stratosphere in the tropics and five different reanalysis, different generations really. Um, and what it really shows is the impact of RO data. And we all know that uh, radio occultation data have um, been a great success in reanalysis because they act as an anchor. Uh, the biases are very small and there are lots of them and they're nicely distributed um, over the globe. So after about 2006, we have enough of these data in the reanalyses, with the exception of MERA, to anchor them. And you see that very clearly that everything but MERA is pretty much at the same level at this point. Um, so that's the impact of RO data. But what's interesting, I think, is when you look prior to the RO data, then you have uh, the impact of model bias in the different reanalyses because they're not anchored. There are other observations, but there's nothing like the um, RO to constrain the 100 hectopascal levels. So you see the shift uh, ex basically showing uh, what the model biases are at that level. And you see that the two most recent reanalyses, MERA2 and ERA5, are very, very close together. Um, so that's, I think, a really nice sign of progress because what you want to see is that all of this eventually converge, converges to uh, the same thing or nearly the same. Okay, so next slide. I could show you much more of these types of examples of issues and progress and so on. But this is a list that I think covers more or less what it really takes to um, make progress in these things. Um, it's work on input observations. So we need better input observations. There are lots of problems with them, uh, especially the satellite-based. I'll show a few things in a minute. Um, the model input itself, so the radiative forcing and boundary conditions have to be improved continuously. Uh, biases in the models obviously are sort of the ultimate uh, vic um, victim now uh you know culprit here and and they have to be addressed but of course that takes a very long time it's very difficult we have to improve the observation operators so that we model the older instruments better we need to improve quality control of observations the data simulation itself um, does not in most cases handle biases explicitly with the exception of variational bias correction and we constrained 40 var but those are only really beginning to be used properly and they're all of course more fundamental problems with um, attri attribution of biases and data simulation but work has to be done on all of that and then the one that you see at the end might not seem to belong there but it turns out that many of these problems that we see in reanalysis are simply mistakes or things that weren't caught because it's a huge production uh, to run a reanalysis and monitoring the performance in close to real time is difficult. It's much more difficult than NWP systems because we're running, um, you know, often in parallel, hundreds of days a week in a reanalysis, and you have to follow all of that very cl very closely. So that is also a big um, issue, and I think that I, the message here is that there are so many different areas. And all of them, when you think about it, are not things that you can do in a few months or that you can do by yourself. So it's really indicating that progress requires um, distributed work, so collaborative work on many, many different fronts. Um, and that's really the only way to um, to keep going and keep improving the, the quality of the read analysis products. Uh, next, please. So now there are a few slides that show a little bit more detail on some of these issues. I'll, I'll go quickly again, because I think I'm gonna run out of time. 
but this shows, for example, the variational bias corrections produced on sounder data, radiance data in ear interim. And they're very interesting. You see for different channels, for different instruments, um, very strange behavior. Some of them are consistent with each other. Some of them are totally different. And there are many different causes for this. So if you click again, <clears throat> we've identified some of them. Um, and this leads to work. Uh, each of these things leads to work. There are lots of issues in all the bullets that I just showed you. Uh, the upper left one in the mid upper stratosphere, that's an SSU issue. There's a pressure loss, a CO2 loss because of a pressure leak in the instrument uh, that made it drift. Um, other things in later on in the stratosphere have to do with how the radius on data were used. Um, there are fewer or more and more radius on data, but they weren't properly adjusted for biases themselves. Um, there are pinatubo effect, so that has to do with the model. So you see all kinds of issues here, models, observation operators, quality control, etc. And that leads to a lot of work by a lot of different people. So some of them are listed here, which then ultimately leads to improvement. Sometimes the data are reprocessed, sometimes the observation operators are um, improved, etc. Next, please. So a little bit quickly about era five, new things in era five relative to era interim is basically the length. Um, it started as a, uh, you know, to reproduce the 1979 period to the present, but it's being, it's, it has been expanded, extended back to 1950 and there are plans to go further back. Um, there is better availability close to real time. At the moment, it's two to five days. Uh, that's really important for this um, services aspect because there are lots of um, applications that, that want the updates immediately. The assimilation system, of course, is 10 years newer, so there are lots and lots of different uh, benefits of that. The model input has been greatly improved. Um, the input observations I'll talk about in a minute are are really revisited almost comprehensively and that I think is a major change over area interim which was basically a very small scale project that happened to be very successful but it, it just used the same things basically that were used for era 40 and I think that a really important thing about reanalysis today is that we have much better input observations that have been reprocessed and recalibrated um, by different groups, uh, data providers, etc. So there are other improvements. Variational bias correction is applied to uh, different, um, not just the radiances, but many other uh, instruments as well. And of course, the resolution is much better than your interim. Next, please. So just a few uh, slides. This is the um, input observations. Um, you don't have to look at all of it, but the message here, there are actually two slides because it doesn't fit on one, is number one, there are there's a huge uh, amount of uh, instruments to be handled in a reanalysis like this. Um, the blue ones, if you could, could you go back just a second to the previous? The blue uh, bars indicate the observations that have been reprocessed, especially for era five. So they were uh, perhaps used in era, era interim, but they have been improved since then. And that's a, that's a major part of the observing system, including RO data, AMVs pretty comprehensively, ozone, etc. Next, please. So that's just a very complex um, picture and a huge amount of work goes into this. And again, I, I should say that under Copernicus, um, there is funding for this um, for different groups. It's not just being done by ESMWF. In fact, most of it is not done at ESMWF. It's done by um, other groups in, in Europe and uh, data providers and so on, satellite agencies. Um, but it's all done for the purpose of improving reanalysis. Um, I should say that uh, since we're looking at these observations, and one of the things that the Joint Center wants to do is to develop an observation data store that um, 
can share, can make it shareable, uh, these, these type of data sets that have been especially improved for reanalysis could be, could be shared on that data store. And we have um, uh, ECMWS word that they are um, interested in that, and that, that could really help the US effort as well. Okay, next please. This shows you analysis increments, uh, a complete summary of analysis increments for era five, globally averaged, and I think weekly or monthly average, probably monthly average. And there's a lot of information here. Um, I don't have too much time to talk about what's wrong with it. There are definitely, definitely still some issues, especially in the stratosphere, which in some sense is even worse than here interim. But if you just flip please back and forth once or twice with the next slide. This is area interim. So you see much different amplitude. So the, the analysis increments in era five are overall much smaller. And that's a very good sign. That means that the background is generally much closer to the observations. Um, and there are uh, fewer problems with um, jumps and sort of obvious artifacts. Ozone is a good example. In fact, the whole ozone input was pretty much new for, for era five with very good um, impact of that. Next, please. Uh, spatial resolution and temporal resolution. You can see that in representation of storms. This is just a nice animation that shows uh, the, the Florence uh, event in 2018. And it makes a big difference to have hourly uh, data on, on a on a much finer grid. Next, please. And this is also, I think, interesting. If you click once, you see here the, because we're now using ensembles also at the Eastern WF. I know that, uh, that that was not pioneered by us by no means, but now, now this is the standard for, for reanalysis is to have some kind of ensemble to give some uncertainty information. And this, um, 20th century reanalysis, Sierra 20C, which um, is a coupled ocean atmosphere reanalysis, but using only surface observations. The ensemble there gives you um, an indication of the um, uncertainties. And you see, uh, if you look at the, uh, so these are zonal means, obviously, and averaged over a whole season. And you, you know, uncertainties are large where things are red and small where they're green. And you can see clearly that only in the northern hemisphere and in the tropics, where the where the variability is less, you you have smaller uncertainties. But basically, southern hemisphere is not uh, not very accurate at all, and the upper levels aren't either. Uh, one click, please. But then, if you look at the era five in 1971, we are already in a much better position because. Of course, that means that we have lots of upper air data in the northern hemisphere that are used. Um, so this is pre-satellite, but still there are plenty of um, other instruments to allow reducing the uncertainties. Uh, one more click. And then if you look at 1980, which is the beginning of the satellite era, you see that the southern hemisphere also becomes more uh, well-defined. And finally, one more click. Um, if you look at um, era five close to today with the observing system that we have today, the spread in the ensemble indicates that we actually have pretty good um, accuracy in temperature um, for the whole season. Now, these are so-called synoptic uncertainties that the, that the ensemble gives us. It doesn't tell us anything about error bars or trends and, and climate scales. That's something that we have to keep in mind. It's a whole different problem to, to estimate those types of uncertainties. Uh, next, please. And we're gonna go skip this because I realize I'm running pretty late. So if you go one more, just quickly, I wanted to add one more thing. Um, next thing that's coming up um, at ESMWF anyway is a, well, also in the US as I understand it, is that the next reanalysis should be coupled with the ocean and sea ice. And this at, uh, in, in, at ECMWF, we, we have some experience with this because in the era Klim projects, we developed a way to do that within the um, incremental 4 var system that is in the IFS by essentially coupling the model in the outer loop 
and keeping the linearized uh, analysis solvers uh, separate, but only in the inner loops. So if you iterate that idea, so the outer loop is always using a fully coupled model, then the impact of observations in any of the components in the ocean or in the atmosphere um, are transferred through the coupled model to the other components. And the key thing here is that the final analysis is the output of the coupled model. And I think that's a really key feature that I would argue should be the case for almost any coupled um, data simulation system, because that's the only way that you can make sure that the analysis state is really consistent at the interfaces. Um, if you click once, you'll see more detail which i won't go into so click twice i mean once more <laughs> thank you this is just an example of what can happen so this was done in the year Klim project again and we did both a, a century-long atmospheric reanalysis just for the atmosphere with monthly boundary conditions as usual for sst that's era 20c so that's the typical thing. You have monthly information about SST and you do essentially interpolation to get the daily boundary conditions. And that cannot be physical. The Sierra 20C is coupled with the atmosphere. And in this case, the SST, external SST was used as a weak constraint to relax to in order to control the bias. But the state was, de was, was developed by the coupled model. So then you see, for example, these tropical instability waves appearing because they, they require the atmospheric, I mean, sorry, the, the atmospheric, the ocean dynamics to be generated. And there's, that's, this is really a coupled uh, phenomenon where the atmosphere responds to the wind stresses, but you need the coupling to really see these. And so this picture on the left, it may not be accurate. This is a Hofmuller diagram, by the way. It may not be fully accurate, but at least it's plausible. Whereas the picture on the right is not even plausible and there's no way for it to be accurate. So, so that's, I think, a, an important thing to um, try to build into a design for a coupled data simulation system. And there are several papers by Patrick Lalorio on this, on the design of these um, reanalyses, the actual coupling in the data simulation, et cetera, that I recommend. Next, please. So final slide, um, I've tried to explain that we are in a really happy situation in Europe that there is this sustained funding framework um, given by Copernicus. The focus is on climate, which is actually good because th that's sort of the fundamental thing in reanalysis that needs work. That also supports a lot of the work on improving the observational input. Uh, that includes, for example, satellite data rescue and reprocessing so data rescue for for satellite instruments is really important and it's not often um, considered um, in our community so well so much not as much as the conventional data rescue but it's really key to try to um, make use of the early satellite instruments and if we don't do it soon then we won't be able to do it anymore um, so the next global reanalysis will be coupled with ocean sea ice i just explained and uh, finally it's always been a collaborative effort. It just I hope that if you take away one thing from this talk, it's how much work is involved in um, getting the next reanalysis to be better than the previous one. And it involves work on all fronts. It's not just the model. It's not just the observations. It's also the technical parts and everything else. And it really requires collaboration. Um, and I think now in my, especially in my new role at the Joint Center, I really would like to help the effort that is happening here in the US, as I understand it, and make it um, more collaborative and therefore better. And the things that we can do or help with at least is to set it up so that the observation input can be shared, including the input that was used in era five. So we have this, uh, uh, vision on this uh, R2D2 uh, repository for research and data and diagnostics. Sorry, repository for research data and diagnostics, um, which will serve 
not only the NWP data simulation, but also reanalysis. Um, we would like uh, in our next AOP anyway to start addressing observation operators for older instruments um, so that they can support uh, reanalysis production. And then we also are working really hard on making it very easy to evaluate observation impact in data simulation. And that should be um, uh, possible to do also with the new um, ideas on, on coupled data simulation. We should be able to um, provide some tools to um, evaluate the, the benefit of each of these different methods. So I'm sorry I went a little bit too long. I blame Tom because he talked about the, the introduction was much too long. So it's his fault. Um, but now I'm ready to answer one or two questions if you have any. Um, Dr. B, can you see the question box? Um, if you cannot, nope. then I can read out the questions to you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So uh, the first question is by, actually, there's only one question, and it's by Shay Weiwei. He asks, yeah. Dr. B, could you please provide an example of how DA system could ex exasperate the problem? Sure. Yes. Um, <clears throat> there are several examples. Um, I think the easiest one to understand is that the, the DA system through the background air covariances uh, tends to make multivariate adjustments, right? So if you change temperature somewhere in the mid latitudes, you also have to um, modify the, uh, the wind field, otherwise you get an unbalanced increment. And so if you have uh, biased observations in one variable, um, the, the multivariate nature of data simulation can introduce biases in other variables. And there are lots of examples of that, maybe not so much with wind and temperature, but for example, with um, some of the satellite uh, observations and channels that are sensitive to both humidity and temperature, for example, they may make large temperature um, um, sorry, uh, humidity adjustments just because the temperatures are mismatched. Uh, and that's not, in some cases, that is systematically the wrong thing to do, depending on the situation and the other constraints. So that, that's the basic mechanism through which um, biases in one variable can easily uh, creep into the others. Um. Mamana, yeah. um, go ahead, yeah. Uh, uh, Joshua Wu, can you unmute yourself? I cannot unmute you if you want to ask a question. Joshua Wu? Yeah. Uh, you can unmute yourself, just ask your question. You, you raise your hands, right? There's no more question in the question box. Anybody want to ask a question? You you can just speak out. We can unmute you. So yeah, looks like uh, we don't have any more questions. Okay. Well, if people have questions uh, later that they come up with, they can always contact me. Yes, uh, please, uh, if you want to, um, you can contact Dr. D directly. If you need uh, assistance, just write to us. Uh, we are going to make the recording and the PPT slides available on the UFS portal. Uh, thank you, everybody, for participating. Thank you, Dr. D, for the wonderful talk. My pleasure.